Charles. Hello, Jared. How you doing? I'm great. Nice to see you. Thank you so much for getting out of your spacesuit to come and sit with us. <laughs> How I wish I got out of a spacesuit. I haven't been in one in decades. My perspective on Earth changed dramatically the very first time I went into space. Six, five, four, three, two, one. And I remember launching from the Kennedy Space Center and about 11 minutes into the flight, I'd raise my seat up and I saw this big island coming up. The big island turned out to be the continent of Africa. There were no lines. It was just one big body. I was technically incredibly well qualified. I was emotionally a wreck. I just was not prepared to see my planet and the continent from which my ancestors had come, and I wept. I, I, was, I was overcome with emotion. You know, I flew four times. Every time I flew, while the familiarity with the environment became sort of natural, the wonder and awe of it never changed. My second flight, when we deployed the Hubble Space Telescope, we were 400 miles, 600 kilometers above Earth, and that's farther than humans have been other than going to the moon. And from there, you see almost all of Earth at any given time. I remember flying over the Middle East, looking down at how peaceful it looked and how beautiful it looked, and then being shaken into reality, understanding what was going on down there, and, and you ask yourself, why? You know how it should be, because you're looking at it the way it ought to be. So why isn't it? And you challenge yourself that when you come back to Earth, you're gonna do everything in your power to make it the way it ought to be, the way it was intended to be. We just celebrated the 15th anniversary of the International Space Station last week the effort of about 16 different nations of the world for Americans who are my age, who go back to World War II, to be from that era and have any imagination that the U.S. would ever be partnered with Germany, Japan, and Russia, working cooperatively 250 miles above space for 15 years, doing things that make life better for people down here on Earth is mind-boggling. Do you think that we need to become an interplanetary species in order to survive? There will come a time, depending on how we treat this planet, that humanity may want to leave this planet. And so we're trying to make an effort right now to demonstrate the fact that humanity can, in fact, leave Earth the way we did when we went to the moon. But the difference is going to be we're going to Mars to stay, as President Obama says. Why is it so important to go to Mars? And what are we going to do to make it happen? We know that Mars was once like Earth. Mars is still developing, just as Earth is still developing. And since everything in the solar system started from the same place, the more we can learn about the planet Mars, the more we'll know about our own planet Earth here. Mars went through some pretty bad times. It's now a desolate, cold planet, and its atmosphere is constantly being scraped away, leaving it with a very, very, very thin atmosphere today. But we know that there's now flowing water there and that says that there is a possibility that life could once have existed, may still exist, or could be sustained in the future. What are we gonna do to get there? How do we get there? Today, NASA is building something called the Space Launch System. It'll be the largest heavy lift launch vehicle built by humanity to date. And we're gonna put the crew in a crew module called Orion, and they'll lift off from the Kennedy Space Center and head toward Mars, and it'll take about eight months to get there. Ahead of them, several years ahead of them, will have gone robotic vehicles carrying most of the cargo and the habitats in which they're gonna live. It's a very, very difficult and challenging mission. What's gonna stop us? Nothing will stop us except ourselves. There are a number of hurdles that we have to overcome. Perhaps the three biggest in my mind are things that most people might never think of. One is budgets. 
This is an international effort. We work with our international partners day in and day out on this. Many of the partners are from Europe, and so right now they're challenged by the refugee crisis. All these things come into play when you talk about budgets. Hurdle number two is politics. You know, it's getting, it's getting from one administration to the next administration to the next administration. And the third challenge is the challenge of willpower on the part of the American people and people around the world. What does the phrase beyond the horizon mean to you? Your eyes can see to the horizon, and then anything beyond that, you've got to imagine. And so that's what we spend our lives here at NASA doing, looking as far as we can look, whether it's with telescopes or the human eye, and then trying to figure out, OK, how do we get just beyond that? That's looking beyond the horizon. The beauty of Earth from the vantage point of space changes your whole perspective about this planet and our responsibility to it. It's all our planet, no matter what our race, creed, color, background, home of origin or anything. And that's one of the driving forces for me to want to get as many people to space as possible. If you could go anywhere in space, where would you go? I would like to go to Mars. I'd like to be the first old man on Mars, you know. Uh, by the time we go to Mars, I'll be uh, about 75 or so. And I think that's, that's a good age to go. Don't tell my wife that I said that. Okay, it'll be a secret between you and I. <laughs>